Hey, folks, be sure to check out our sponsor, The War for the Tower podcast, which is an actual play RPG podcast set in the world of Stephen King's Dark Tower. You can find them by searching for War for the Tower in your podcatcher or by heading over to warforthetower.com. Long days and pleasant nights. This is an unspoiled network podcast. This is some spoiled A Song of Ice and Fire 2, the co-host switcheroo, the re reading Return to Westeros, HBO Spoiler Edition, uncut, uncensored, and too hot for TV, bringing you the greatest hits from 96. <laughs> Call in with your request now. In these chapters, which are 67 and 68, Sansa and Daenerys, <laughs> Sansa deals with both her grief and the extreme cruelty of her fiancé, and Daenerys, well, she's also grieving. It's bad. Yeah. Something of this book is very sad. Welcome to Unspoiled. Monsters are dangerous, and just now, kings are dying like flies. I am the king! Fuck the king. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I'm Rashawn. So, um, last week... We started off with me apologizing to everybody for being very uh, unprofessional, flippant, whatever. I feel like I really nailed it this week. I would like some recognition for that. <laughs> and what did you think of these chapters? Oh, man. These were, I mean, we knew that this was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, if, but, man, it's dark. Shit is yeah. looking really bad for our our friends our dear, dear friends, <laughs> this is a this is a real, real low point, and we are um, just you know we're we're coming right up on the end of this first book now. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really, really close. This uh, both were difficult to read because both of our young ladies are facing such tremendous heartache. You yeah. know, the kind that just makes you ball up and be completely useless for a good chunk of time, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of, that kind of horror and pain, um, and great loss. This Sansa chapter, guys, it was without hyperbole devastating. <laughs> yeah. It, really is something to be in her mind as she is living these these few next days after watching her father be murdered executed murdered mm -hmm. depending on who you t who you ask you know commentary <laughs> you know what bitch it was <laughs> it really was um but uh, that aside, it's she's so terribly alone. Mm -hmm. um, I have forgotten, or either it wasn't in the show, that they killed fucking the Septa. Uh, oh, yeah. And it's odd because I haven't thought about her since all this shit jumped off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just haven't given her any thought. So when her name comes up, uh, Sansa had also not given her any thought. <laughs> yeah, she's been a little distracted, but it doesn't excuse that she hasn't thought about Arya really. Also, you know, but but yeah. um, but yeah, uh, she is so alone. Um, there's no more Jane Poole. Is it Jane or Jenny? Yeah, it's Jane. Jane. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, spelled weird. Right. It's like J A Y N E or something. J E Y. Oh, is it an E in there too? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. All right. Starting to get to white people name territory. <laughs> um. <laughs> I saw this post today where somebody's like announcing to their friend that they're pregnant and they said, Oh, have you considered any names? And they said, yeah, we're thinking. And they spelled it. And I got to spell this for you. R E I G H F E L, you know, pronounced like rifle. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and the response, cause it was a screenshot of a back and forth text was just, Oh, it was it. Just an oh. And that was like the end of the exchange. And I was like, I'm dying to know what happened after that, though. Come on. Um, mm, mm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, rifle. Perfectly normal thing to name it. Sure, after. sure. Yeah, cool. yeah. It was in a group called Just Because America Can Doesn't Mean America Should. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, that's a fucking life lesson right there. <laughs> kids listening at home. Um, anyway, sorry everybody. Yeah, so she is just she's so isolated. Like there's these people that have been kind of around her through a lot of this uh, chicanery. You know, those people are gone now. I feel vaguely uh, <laughs> like picketed. I don't know if I like that. What's that about? <laughs> I didn't really stop to hear it like out loud before, but. <laughs> What the fuck? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, anyway, fuck. I'm sorry. Um, like, you know. But, so she is, uh, she's in this, you know, her room in this tower. And, uh, you know, she's just reliving this most awful moment. And she's having these horrible dreams. Um which, you know, Daenerys is also having, like, crazy dreams, too. It's another thing that, you know, the mm-hmm. chapters have a lot of the same, like, beats. Yeah. Um, and she has been left alone to kind of mourn, um, not out of anything that I think comes even close to, like, compassion or anything. No, no. But just kind of a, like, just leave her up there, you know, until she, until we need her. Mm-hmm. Right or do yeah, we feel it, like, it's very like we're done with her for now kind of yeah energy. yeah yeah um, and then uh, Joffrey shows up because he wants her to come to court and uh, this 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 interaction um, first of all he comes in with like five dudes mm-hmm. sir little boy why. <laughs> Yep. You know, he's got he's got the hound with him, which okay, that's his King's Guard. He's supposed to be with him all the time. Whatever, that's fine. But then he's got uh is it uh Marin Mervin? Mervin. Marin Tran. It should Mervin. be Mervin. <laughs> <laughs> Marin Tran. Marin Tran. Is uh Jano slant with him too? Um, I don't remember that. I don't I know mean, if it's look. him. Uh Iller Payne came. Ellen. Ellen, like a villain. Oh, he's Ellen, like a villain, bit girl. Mm-hmm. We are not going to podcast together anymore after this. Listen, <laughs> I only just discovered, like, somebody had to point it out to me that his name is Ill in Pain. Oh my god! <sighs> Do you know, like, what a fucking fool I feel like for not <laughs> noticing that shit? <laughs> That is dad joke level. <laughs> and I just totally missed it. Uh, I feel like we don't even deserve these books now. Listen, he doesn't <laughs> deserve these books. <laughs> the creator of these. <sighs> anyway, um, okay. So it's Joffrey the Hound, uh, Sir Marin, and there is a, another person there. I'm just trying to see who it was. But be, be whoever it is, they all roll up into her little her little room and basically yank the the you know black sheets off of the window. <laughs> right, yes. And she goes <laughs> <laughs> And um 
tells her, you know, you need to be cleaned up. I want you at court. And she really is doesn't want to hear any of this. Mm-hmm. And uh, he has one of them. I think it's the guy whose name I can't fucking... Marin. Think. No, not Marin. Is it Marin the one who hits her? I thought so. Yeah. All right. Maybe, okay. maybe um, let's see. Luke, I think you're Luke. right. I think it it is Marin that hits her. But there is somebody else there. And... Yeah, he's like, you know, my mom says that the king shouldn't hit a woman or hit his wife. Right. So he just kind of gives his his man the, you know, the nod. And he just goes over and just backhands her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Sir Marin Trance stood over her with blood on the knuckles of his white silk glove. Like a bitch. Basically. And she keeps calling him my lord, too, throughout this chapter, which <laughs> is really upsetting to Joffrey. He has to keep correcting her. I enjoy and, it a lot. You know, I did, too. And I, I hated it for her because I was like, oh, you got to stop. This guy is fucking insane. You got to mm-hmm. stop beating him like this. But also a part of me was like, yes, bitch. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> keep calling him that. Um, But the most striking thing about this whole chapter is, for me... Was uh, the hound. Yeah. Um, He gives her, honestly, some of the best advice I've heard so far in this. <laughs> you know, it, um, he says, you know, because she's begging, like, tell me what does he want? And he says, you know, he wants you to be smiling. And uh, where's the actual line? Um, let's see. I've been like kind of jumping around here. Uh, let's see. Oh my God. I forgot about the, (laughs) to the death, which he keeps saying. Um, (laughs) When they actually, when he's, uh, it's a little bit later when she's, it's not when he's bringing her downstairs. Is he? Um, no, I guess it is because by the time later they go out to the like, this all him telling her this happens before she goes out onto the ramparts, right? Here it is. He wants you to smile and smell sweet and be his lady love. He wants to hear you recite all your pretty little words the way the Septa taught you. He wants right. you to love him and fear him. Yeah. And that's exactly what he wants. You know? Yep. It's really spot on um advice and observation, which you have to figure uh he has been watching Joffrey his entire life. He knows mm-hmm. exactly what and who this little boy is, you know? Yeah. He knows his uh, his um, aptitude for cruelty, you know? Mm-hmm. He knows just how terrible this little boy can be, um, which... So was- weird how you keep calling him little boy, and, like, he is, <laughs> but it also, I'm just like... Ew, I guess he is. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's a, it must be a really strange position to be in. Uh, I'm talking about the hound, where right. you are so keenly aware of how terrible a person is, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know it better than practically anyone else. And yet, you have no power to disobey them. Or, you know, punish them in any way Mm -hmm. when they, when they act up and that often you are the victim of that very particular type of cruelty. Yeah. It, it, because there's not a lot, it doesn't translate to the real world in such an extreme way for most of us, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are some instances when you talk about people with tremendous wealth and power. But for most of us, we're not really going to ever directly be in contact with people that have that much money or that much power. Most of us, the person with the most power over our lives is like our boss. Right. You know, and our boss might make, depending on what we do for a living, you know, Whatever, how much money they make a year. Maybe they make $500,000 a year. They're not making Oprah money, you know. Your right. boss's boss's boss might make Oprah's money, but not like the guy <laughs> you talk to every Monday morning. You know what I mean? Right, yes. So, to 
it's hard to imagine. Like there's a it's jumping ahead. There's that moment where Sansa on the um, where they when he goes to show her Ned's head ramparts. He's a real, ramparts. That's what thank I keep you. Saying, but I don't know if that's <laughs> true. Um, where she's contemplating just pushing his ass right over the edge, which is mm-hmm. the right thing to be thinking about in this moment. And the hound, it doesn't say it explicitly, but I think we're supposed to really infer that he a hundred percent knew what the fuck she was thinking about. She could, yeah. he recognized everything about her in that moment. And it's gotta be because, you know, maybe he's had that same feeling mm-hmm. <laughs> like he saw on her face and he knew instantly, oh, this bitch is thinking about killing this little motherfucker. And he doesn't stop her in a way that draws attention to what she was thinking. Mm-hmm. He just puts himself between her and Joffrey, you know, which was really a startling act of kindness. You think so? I think so. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting. You don't complete- think that she should have? He should have let her kill him. Well, no. What I mean is, by the kindness, I mean not drawing attention to what she was thinking, uh, and like and like okay. war- and like warning Joffrey or something, or making it like a big deal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. like obviously, uh, I wish that she had just pushed him right over the fucking edge, <laughs> even though. Um, that would make for a very interesting turn in the story because then the only witness is the hound. And does the hound like back up a story because he also yeah. hates Joffrey and like concocted it was just an accident or does, or does he, you know, apprehend her and bring her to justice? You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I would love that. Like, because you know, I, I, often am like I just have no real interest in fan fiction but something like that where it's coping with like the reality of what would happen if Sansa has succeeded Mm -hmm. that would be fascinating to read by somebody who was a good writer and really understood the material and the characters Mm. I would be very dead like I don't I am perfectly happy with the way this goes story wise I'm Mm -hmm. not like I wish so much that she had been allowed to do that like no, that wouldn't have worked. She would right. have been screwed. Yeah, but yeah. I still want to see it play out and how it could be handled. Yeah, I'm thinking like if if even if the hound says no, it was definitely an accident. He lost his footing or whatever and fell over. Mm-hmm. Um what happens and who believes him, you know? Right. And so then you have to think, well, Cersei is going to be like enraged at the death of her son Mm -hmm. but also she's like for real for real queen regent now you know (laughs) like her like oh you know and tommen is so young that like she's got this chair and this power for for a good little minute now um but also she's so vengeful that like i can completely see cersei choosing to be adamant that sansa must have killed Joffrey, mm. even if she can't prove it, and just deciding that the hound, who has been a loyal and faithful servant, has suddenly just turned for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I, I could see it going both ways. But, um, but yeah, before we get up to the rampart where he shows her Ned's head and, and tries to show her uh, Septa's head, which is so, like, gnarled that she's like, I don't even know who this is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, she gets herself dressed and pretty and goes down to court and watches him be mostly bored and petulant while mm-hmm. the council actually does the business of court until he gets involved, like you said, with uh, getting really excited about killing people. <laughs> what the fuck else is new? Some woman comes to beg for the head. And you know what's funny? I misread that sentence too. It says the woman came to beg for the head of like her traitorous husband or something. Mm-hmm. And it took me a second to realize, no, it's not a metaphor. She's not like begging for his life. She's literally asking if she can take the head Oh home. my God. <laughs> That didn't even occur to me, but it makes total sense if you would think that he was... 
<laughs> That'd be so. Oh my god, I love this now. Like I've come to ask for your daughter's hand. Yeah, and you oh want the real? Oh my god, I'm so happy for you. Why? What? No. Oh, I see the mistake. Lost in translation. Her actual hand. Chop it off. Right. No, you can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and Joffrey's response is. Well, if you loved a traitor, you must be a traitor, too. And has her hauled off to the dungeons. Yep. Um, the other two that you joked about, uh, <laughs> the two knights that are fighting over land or some shit. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, you have to fight to the death for it. And you're just like, uh, I thought this was uh, civil court, you know, right? like small claims court. Like, <laughs> going to the death. What? Oh my God, Joffrey is <coughs> Judge Judy. Oh my that would God. be pretty uh, <laughs> bloody. <laughs> Joffrey would have been a really great like reality oh TV show God. producer, though. He really would. Though <laughs> his show, all his shows would be lit. <laughs> so, um, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna just like overall the whole thing with. Uh, Marin Trant, like, because when he comes to collect her to bring her down in the first place, she kind of needles him. She says something like, "Will did he tell you to hit me if I won't come?" And his response is simply, "Are you refusing to come?" Yeah, and it's it, it like takes a moment for her to realize that it's not that he dislikes her, which is how she immediately took it, which you mm-hmm. would when somebody fucking hits you, especially yeah. as a yeah. child. But that he doesn't give any fucks about yeah, her. Yeah, she is so unimportant to him. She is nothing. Mm-hmm. It is just a matter of following following his orders. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with her at all. Um, and, and she sh- says he's not a true knight, and he just has like no reaction. Yeah, at he's all. like, yeah, doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she thinks to herself that if the hound hit her, her say that he'd probably get a couple giggles though. <laughs> um. There's also when they first come to get her, uh, when she still like hasn't been up and dressed and everything, uh, and he, one of the things Joffrey is saying uh, is that, you know, he needs her to come down to court, and also that they're still engaged, right? Um, and she is like engaged. What? <laughs> uh, and she begs to be let to go home, and he's just like, yeah, no, we we're still engaged, and she says. First of all, I don't want to marry you. Second of all, you chopped off my dad's head. <laughs> yep. Why the fuck would you think I would still marry you? And he, it has not, I don't want to say it hasn't occurred to Joffrey that she wouldn't want to marry him. It just doesn't matter mm-hmm. to him what she wants at all. And throughout this whole chapter, we keep hearing Sansa say things about how she can't believe she thought he was so handsome. Mm-hmm. Like, she's looking at him now, and she's disgusted by him. She describes his mouth as being, like, grave worm lips, which is... Yeah. Ugh. Um, and, like, she can't believe that she ever thought he was handsome or noble or good or any of those things. I was uh, thinking about this when I was doing a solo show the other day. Have you ever found yourself attracted to somebody that you knew was a bad person? Like, objectively did bad things and, and held bad opinions and you still like found them attractive anyway? Because I don't feel like that's ever happened. Like, I'll have that happen with like fictional characters. That's different. But like a person that you genuinely think is... A bad Mm-mm. sort. No, I haven't. I don't think I've ever had that. Mm-mm. And I'm just wondering, like, if there are people out there that that doesn't matter to them and they would still find somebody super attractive anyway. But for me, it's just they're so linked that I don't care how hot I used to think you are. I'm going to hate the sight of your face once I, like, know things about you, you know? Yeah. I guess, too, it really just becomes a matter of what we're calling like bad, you know, cause it can mm-hmm. be so subjective. Like, uh, I'm trying to, th- I've had people, I've had, the, I think we've all had the opposite way where there are people that you have found attractive. And then 
later learn some things about them and then mm-hmm. find them less attractive, right? Like sure. that's that I feel like is like very common. But being attracted to somebody who is terrible <laughs> despite their terribleness, that's really a matter of degrees. Yeah. I don't think that I've ever really <sighs> You know what too though, y'all? A lot of those motherfuckers I just did not really even know that well. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't care that much about them enough to know. You know what? That is relatable. I feel you. So it can be kind of hard for me to say. But, uh, but yeah, no. Um, but this thing that science is experiencing where, like, the, the whole, the scales fell from my eyes. Right. Like, that shit, I've 100% been there. Oh, yeah. Like, 100%. And, um... I mean, thank God I wasn't, like, slated to marry any of them like she is. It's a real unfortunate situation <laughs> she finds herself in. Indeed. Um, and she tells him that she hates him. Yeah. What a um, risk. Yeah. And she hasn't been hit yet when she says yeah, it, though, Yeah, so that's, she that's what, know. That, that's what fucking brings that up. He, uh, oh, she calls him Lord again <laughs> right after he she gets hit. Uh, so, yes. So then they go down and she watches everything in court and then he takes her up. She does not want to go. She knows where he is taking her. With the minute he's like, you know, come walk with me. Mm-hmm. He calls her stupid. Yeah. Because she keeps slipping with the my Lord, my grace thing. And he tells her that if she's stupid and the kids are stupid, then he'll chop her head off and get somebody that's not as stupid as she is. Mm-hmm. And then he asks her when uh, she can get pregnant. Because they need to get a baby in her right away. And then we're all reminded that she hasn't even had her first period yet, which is super cool. Yep. Um, And then he, you know, takes her upstairs and she is begging not to go. And he threatens to have Sir Marin just drag her up there. And she remembers what Hound has said to her. Uh, And he says in real life, do it, girl. And right. then she kind of imagines the rest of that sentence, which is, uh, he'll have you up there no matter what. So just give him what he wants. But then this amazing thing happens that you don't really expect. It's kind of interesting, right? Right. She doesn't give him what he wants. Yeah. I don't know if it's a conscious choice or if she just doesn't have it in her to give. He wants her to completely melt down. Mm-hmm. He wants this to be... Almost as painful as watching her father be murdered in the first place. Mm -hmm. What he is doing is sadistic. Yes. It is just cruelty for the sake of it. And she looks at her father's head and it doesn't really look like him at all to her. It doesn't even look real. Which is like, you know, it's got to be just this like crazy dissociative thing that's happening because... You're staring at your father's sever, severed head, right? Right, yeah. But be, because of the the trauma of this moment, she has, like, no affect. And he is disappointed. Mm-hmm. Or she at least remarks that he seems disappointed. And she says, how long do I have to look? And yeah. it just takes all the wind out of his sails. It's mm-hmm. It's really something. Mm. I know. It's such a, like, I'll be honest. I had completely forgotten that he does this, that he makes her go up and look at Ned's head. Mm-hmm. And I just like, once I realized what he was doing, it was like, I was reading it for the first time. I had no memory. Mm. And it's weird that I don't, because one of the most famous like shots of Sansa from the show is her with her split lip with this mutinous expression on her face and her hair up. And that's, I'm pretty positive is still from the scene where he shows her his dad's head. So like when you look for Sansa images, which I do for the show a lot, that's the first one that comes up usually because everybody sort of considers it to be the moment of her really understanding. Finally, the position that she's in and who Joff is. Mm. So it's so bonkers to me that I forgot this. I, I, and it's it I don't know if it was like that I didn't fully appreciate the first time 
how sadistic this is, mm-hmm. but it hit me in a way that it hadn't before. And I was just like, where, what, George R. R. Martin, who did this to you? What <laughs> happened that you even thought of this shit, man? Like, ugh. Ugh. Yeah, I hate I it. A, I really hate it. I think that's an appropriate uh, <laughs> response <laughs> to how terrible this this uh... more of this scintillating <laughs> take on this book, <laughs> where I just go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, but um, so this this, like you said, he doesn't have the response that he was looking for Mm -hmm. and then she has this moment um all it would take was a shove she told herself he was standing right there right there smirking at her with those fat worm lips which is all one word worm lips by the way (laughs) you could do it she told herself you could do it right now it wouldn't even matter if she went over with him it wouldn't matter at all which uh I'll be honest, the first time I thought for a second that she was thinking about jumping. And then I realized, like... Yeah, I did, too. You know, I did, too. Um, here, girl, Sandra Clegane knelt before her, between her and Joffrey, with a delicacy surprising in such a big man. He dabbed at the blood welling from her broken lip. So, yeah. yeah. The thing that happens that um, puts her in that... Well, there's a lot of things that happen. After she doesn't have the reaction that he's clearly wanting to get from her, he decides to take her on the tour of all the other heads. And that's when he points out the sept. And then he starts talking about how the empty uh, spikes or pikes or whatever. uh, This one is for Stannis. This one's for Renly. And then he has a special one for her brother. And he Mm -hmm. starts talking about uh getting um Rob and how uh Jamie lost and um Mother says went, it was through trickery. Oh my god. <laughs> and then uh you know what after he's name day he's gonna get an army and go after him and bring he says that's what I'll bring you. I'll bring you your brother's head and she says maybe my brother will give me your head. <laughs> And he does not care for that, and he has uh, him, Sir Marin, hit her again, and then, yeah, she starts thinking about pushing this motherfucker off the edge, and yep. uh, I don't think that she was wrong at all to consider it. Same. I would have been proud. <laughs> he but tells her to wipe off the blood, you're all messy, and I just uh, like, oh, I yeah. really dislike this little kid. This is something that I... Have you seen widows uh yeah i did actually finally watch it you remember the beginning scene with um is it john bernthal is he the one that played the punisher Mm-hmm. there's a, a scene towards the beginning of the movie where he's having breakfast with his girlfriend wife and he clearly punched her in the face the night before and she has a bruise uh a black eye mm-hmm. and he tells her go put some makeup or something over that. I don't like looking at it. I don't like seeing Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And she says something like, yeah, I don't like seeing it either really pointedly. And he gets a fucking attitude with her about it. And I just like, that felt for me like a moment of like Joffrey as a grown up. Mm. you know, like it's different because the John Bernthal character, I think was meant to feel a tiny bit of shame. And so he doesn't want to see it. And her, be making it clear that she thinks less of him for it makes him more angry. And I don't think Joffrey has that kind of conscience. Yeah. Um, but it was just sort of like, it was a moment of just a man, like wanting a woman to hide what he did to her, which is that, such a fucking real life thing. I was going to say that feels like a very real thing. Also something that you see across different types of media, you know, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. kind of that, that clean yourself up after whatever has happened that you've done, you know, right. That, that sort of, it's, it, I think because it accomplishes a couple of things, it's, um, it separates 
the person who just committed whatever violent act happened from the uh, the results of that action, right? Like, sure. Clean, clean yourself up, get rid of the evidence of this terrible thing I just did, mm-hmm. you know? Um, also, there's something about, especially the way Joffrey says it to, to her in this moment, where what he's done to her is so distasteful, but it's not a reflection on him somehow, you know, Mm, like she didn't get his hands dirty, you know, so like she becomes the, yeah, like she becomes the thing that's dirty. It needs to be cleaned. Not the, like the, the fucking fucked up thing you just did. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, 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 Really, when you think about how old this character is supposed to be, which is like 15, 14 or 15. Something in there, He's yeah. younger than Rob. Rob is like 15, right? So he's like mm-hmm. 13 or 14, I guess, with a birthday we know is coming up. Right. Oh, that- my God. I forgot he keeps asking what she's getting mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I hate him so much. <laughs> uh, that... This much horribleness <laughs> can live in someone so young. <laughs> you know, it 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 really makes you think about incest. Ooh. Uh, you know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Interesting. I that mean, was not where I thought that was going. But. I mean, I know it's not because, I mean, I don't know what book Tommen is like, but show Tommen was very sweet, you know. And, I don't and, know. We saw Prince Charles and that really oh my God. doesn't speak highly of the whole. Did you see? I had the funniest fucking thing I saw about that motherfucker dying was somebody was like, why are they acting like he hasn't been dead for the last five years? <laughs> Have you seen his face? <laughs> oh my god. That man looked god awful. Like he I just like the crib keeper. He looked worse than the crib keeper. And I didn't know that was possible. One uh, of my favorite memes is of him in the back of the like he's in the back seat of, and has the driver in the front. And his hands are sort of together, and he's the speech bubble says, "Take me to Buckingham Palace." <laughs> and I fell out like the crypt keeper because he always does puns. So Buckingham says Buckingham Palace. It's Buckingham Malice. And I just I laughed for like twenty minutes at that. I swear to God, oh, it was so that good. Is really good. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Malice. <laughs> Sorry, that's quality humor. Uh, anyway. Uh, how do we get on but now? All the badness living in somebody so young. Oh, yeah. It just, and that it made you think about incest. Oh, that's how we got on them. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, yes, I don't know if incest is really the, the answer to that conundrum because, you know, Tommen was halfway decent and the daughter I didn't know the daughter at all like she was non-existent really on the show like True. she she popped up in time to get like kidnapped yeah and then a, you know and then and then murdered and that was pretty much all I knew <laughs> of her uh so I don't know how Joffrey manages to be as terrible as he is at such a young age and um but you know what? Sometimes people are just terrible people. Mm-hmm. And I think that that might just be the thing here. You yeah. know, like if I hadn't seen the show and I were, I were reading these books, I would probably be hyper focused on finding out what the deal is with this kid. Like, why is he like this? You know, I would probably really be struggling with the idea of someone this young being this cruel um, for what seems like no good reason. Right. Um, The show has at least prepped me for the for I don't know if it bears out exactly, but the show has basically told me that, like, this guy is terrible. He just is. <laughs> so, that language is so mild. I was about to be like, what? No, they didn't. Because it's just not 
how that sounded. <laughs> but yes, you I know, suppose that is technically <laughs> true. <laughs> and just like, don't get yourself all wrapped up in looking for like the whys and explanations. Like he's just the worst. Mm-hmm. Done. So, you know, because otherwise I think I would be completely distracted because it makes no sense. I mean, I feel like even if you don't know from the show, the fact that she's like heard about how he likes to kill animals and stuff points pretty firmly to psychopathic behavior already, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I feel like it's in the, the writing is on the wall there. Yeah. You know, um, it, it, I think I, I have a weird reluctance to ascribing like, Oh, well, there's just something wrong with him. You know, there's just like mm-hmm. a mad, there's like a madness to him, uh, which I guess is, is legitimate. You know, you could think about, um, you know, that shit happens. Some people mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. you know, but I think I, I'm reluctant to do that because I don't want to feel like it's like the author's cheating, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, he's just a psycho, you know, but sometimes that's just all it is to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of interesting um, because I've been having – the more that I, like, cover for Spoil Me, the more I have begin to realize things that either I don't like in storytelling and not even necessarily because it comes up that, oh, I don't like what they did in the show. I'll realize I really like this because I hate when people do it the other way. And so one of the things I've realized is I'm really sort of tired of the whole, like – we have to justify why this villain's a villain and give him mm. some sort of tragic backstory or make him relatable in a humanize him. Basically mm-hmm. I'm sort of tired of it because I feel like what we've done as a culture in a lot of ways is make it so that people don't feel like they have to take responsibility for themselves. Mm. Um, and that, you know, going through trauma can just give you a free pass to inflict trauma on other people. Um, but I – so for that reason, in some ways, I like that it's as simple as he's a psychopath because I don't want to feel a lot of sympathy for the villains mm, these days. Right, right. Um, on the other hand, though, I do understand what you mean about it feeling a little bit like cheating. And also there's something to be said for the like – if you give – the if there is like – I find it distasteful. I'm going, I'm trying to say this in this like diplomatic way as possible. A true crime shows, in my opinion, can really veer towards the uh, fascination slash worship of a psychopath mm-hmm. quickly, mm-hmm. where it's no longer about the horrors that a person inflicted on victims. It becomes about the psychology of the murderer, mm-hmm. what drove them. And, that doesn't happen as much in, in fiction that I read, but I'm certain that it's, like, huge in novels, if you care for that sort of work. And I just sort of enjoy that that's not being done here either. We're going to have him be a psychopath, but we're not going to make him fun. Because that's, like, that's a thing that we'll tend to do if we're in fiction and somebody is, like, will make them sort of at least amusing mm-hmm. or you're sort of interested in, oh my God, what are they going to do next? Like just that they're unpredictable. And Joffrey is just the reality of like a person without empathy in a position of power over anybody. He could just mm-hmm. be a husband that she's being forced to marry. He doesn't it's have to true. be the king. That's true. And that's sort of what makes him so much scarier to me is that like you can just recontextualize everything he does onto a smaller scale and he'd just be a guy who's just toxic and and abusive and bad to be around. And it being that simple is so much like more disturbing to me. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. I think I, um, I can appreciate that, especially when you think about the, how easily we identify with um, any character when we're, re- when we're reading, especially if mm-hmm. we're reading from a POV, uh, it becomes very difficult to 
uh, separate yourself from the POV of the character that you're reading. You see everything right. through their eyes and you, you know, everything that you're experiencing is kind of through them as a filter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess what I am talking about with Joffrey is, and maybe it's what makes me so uncomfortable because you know what the, the, the impulse to explain away people's cruelty um, and and give it, you know, background motivation, whether mm-hmm. it's trauma based or whatever, is because the the reality that p- people can just be cruel because that's just what they are is so fundamentally upsetting. Yeah, you know, and no one wants that to be the thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we we need to have a reason. You know, yeah. so that's what I think I'm reacting to is that the the reality that it, no, there's not always a, a deep reason. There's not always even, you know, a psychological or any other kind of. Um, Where'd you go? I got distracted. Um, you know what I mean? And I think no, I that's, totally do. I think that's just sort of like a the impulse in me to just be like, well, what the fuck? Like, why is this kid like this? Because I want it to make sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, but no, I can appreciate what you're saying too because that that desire in us to make it make sense um can sometimes be doing more damage than it's worth. Yeah, it's a. Uh... You know, it gives. It's another thing that we cling to for an illusion of control. If we just know why this person is so terrible, we can prevent more mm-hmm. terrible people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's what you get all those fucking psychological thrillers and all those TV shows about you know digging into the mind of serial killers and all yep. that bullshit. Yeah. And I just like I can't emphasize enough, you guys, how little fucking patience I have for that. Mm-hmm. Like, look. It's. I'm not trying to just hate on people who like true crime in general because I like, understand a lot of the time the fascination with seeing how like an investigation goes and feeling this like thrill of oh justice is actually being done on this one that's nice you know but also there is a very like ghoulish quality to it a lot that I have seen demonstrated that's like, just feels like you forget that there were real people whose lives were completely fucking ruined. Mm. Um, so playing it for like an entertainment can just really like, I just think about if I were to have a family member be murdered and it be treated that way and people are going to like a live show for a podcast that talks about it. And in the audience, like cheering back catchphrases mm. while my husband, his photo is like on the fucking screen behind them. It's just something that I have a bit of a buck up my ass about. Mm. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so they're um, wildly popular too. They are. And like, I, I, especially among women, which we yeah. get so little justice that it really makes sense. But anyway, sorry <laughs> for my uh, tangent there, but I just thought you brought up a good point and it's just, um, I I guess what it is when it comes down to it, the simplest way to say it is Joff is a psychopath without it being um, gleeful with there not being any sort of like glamour to it. Right. It's just the brutality of a bad, bad person. And I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so that is the end of her chapter. And then we are on to Daenerys. <laughs> Yeah. So if you thought that other chapter was bleak. Yeah. (laughs) This one is... This is... uh, You know, when I was reading this chapter, it was a mixture of being like, okay, there's a lot going on, but like not a lot happening. Mm -hmm. You know? Which is kind of actually pretty much what this chapter is. (laughs) A little bit, yeah. You know? uh, She is... I think it opens in the middle of her having like this crazy fever dream. Yeah. That, that goes on for a couple of pages. It, it was, I will I'll be honest, I had to rewind a couple of times on the audiobook because I straight up just drifted off, like, <laughs> tuned out and totally yeah. missed. I just got kind of bored. Yeah. It, I feel it, bad about it. It went, it went on for a little while mm-hmm. and it was like very circular. Uh, 
And I don't really know what to make of it. I'm not going to lie. I also, I read it. I read it like twice. <laughs> but it had a very similar thing that, for you, uh, which I was just like, what is, what is going on? <laughs> She's in like this weird uh, building, basement, the hallway? I don't know. <laughs> um, she was walking down a long hall beneath high stone arches. She could not look behind her, must not look behind her. There mm-hmm. was a door ahead of her. A red door. <laughs> uh, but even from afar, she saw that it was painted red. She walked faster. And I don't know if that yeah. place is anything or what. And that's what I was like. I was wondering, is it like, is she seeing, you know, she's seeing uh, Viserys. She's seeing Rhaegar. Um there are ghosts, but not ghosts of any particular people that she names, but they're definitely Targaryens, it sounds like. They're all, like, uh, platinum white hair, you know, they have the eyes that are, like, purple and blue, and they're all yelling at her to go faster, you know. And then uh, there's this this waking the dragon is, like, said over and over again, like, as, as a warning you know, mm-hmm. you don't want to wake the dragon, don't wake the dragon, want to wake the dragon. So finally, it's just like, wake the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, what the... Okay. And, um, and then they wake her up because uh, she is making a lot of noise in her sleep. And she has not been well. She has lost the baby. And uh, it sounds like she's been... In and out of consciousness for I'm not sure how much time has passed, but yeah. a little a little while. And enough for basically the entire Calisar to abandon her. Yeah, yeah. She has been like close to death, it seems like, where they weren't really sure if she was gonna come out on the other side. Um and so then uh, Mary Maz comes by. <laughs> <laughs> Our old friend Mary Maz. <laughs> And, uh, you know, she's uh, coming in and, and treating her a little bit as she goes in and out. And then as she finally wakes up for real, which is a couple pages into this chapter, and she's, like, asking for the what's been going on. Mm-hmm. You know, she asks for some water, she asks for some fruit, and she asks what's the tea. And it is all terrible. <laughs> it is indeed. She Ugh. finds out that she asked uh, someone to bring her son to her. And she knows immediately that the the boy didn't live. Like she can tell by the the reaction on whoever she's talking to on their face. I think it's one of her handmaidens maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she... She thinks to herself that she she should cry, but she can't because she says her eyes are as dry as ash. She had s- cried so much in her sleep that she's like, can't even cry now. Mm. Um, until later. Yeah. And this is when they tell her what her child was. What do you think of this? I don't know what to think. Uh, he says he heard, uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. What's, yeah, what? company? No, that's Owen going into his office. Oh, wow. That shit sounded like it was coming right into your room. <laughs> it's so wild because you said that twice tonight, but he goes yeah. in and out of his office while I'm recording all the time. I never, ever really notice it or hear it. I don't know why it's so loud tonight. <laughs> I don't know. That's so strange. Um, so she's also got this thing happening with the eggs where she she notices they feel like they're radiating heat. Right. And that seems weird. And she asks Jorah what does he feel? And he's like nothing. <laughs> it's, which it's which, a rock. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? You asked me uh, about the she, the bait cuz like Mary Mazdor says monstrous twisted. I drew him forth myself. He was scaled like a lizard lined with the stub of a tail and small leather wings like the wings of a bat when i touched him the flesh sloughed off the bone and inside he was full of grave worms and the stink of corruption he had been dead for years i don't believe her you don't think so (laughs) 
Only because I don't know how that makes sense. I don't know what to do with that. Like, if what she is saying is real, what the fuck is that? Magic? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't Sean know. does not accept that. I don't know. I don't think I do. Because <laughs> um, it sounds to me like he was turning into a fucking dragon. Well, yeah. Obviously. Right? Like... Obviously, and but my how, why and how is my question. <laughs> that's what Danny's dream was that she was turning into a dragon, and that there were like wings bursting out of her back, and she could fly, and she could fly. I um, nope. I don't know what to do with this, y'all. Okay. I'm sorry. There. I don't know what to do with this. Uh. I don't I don't know what to do with this <laughs> because the next question is is if all that cuz she says he's been dead for years. Right. Right. Are we supposed to think that this deformity, this this whatever, this monstrosity as she calls it was was only after the spell and the spell did this not only did the spell cause the miscarriage or the stillbirth, but it also changed it or if say none of this happened and uh, Cal Drogo didn't die, they didn't have to do the spell. Was Danny just going to give birth to a fucking real dragon? Is that what we're supposed to be thinking? I don't know because I don't I don't know what to do with that. Like if her son was going to be the dragon in the, in the less literal way, mm-hmm. like the way Viserys would use it, right? And then the spell kind of turned it into a literal dragon. <laughs> then I guess, you know, if if that's what we're thinking. But nothing is telling me that that's what happened. And I just don't, I mean, they're telling me that she gave birth, even though the, the baby didn't live. She gave birth to what looks like a little baby dragon. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> Mother of dragons. No. Yeah, no, no, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> Everybody was singing Absolute, it, I just said it. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, I, I, don't, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with this when I saw it on the television, and I don't know what to do with it now. I just, um... I don't know. So Daenerys tells everybody to leave. And she says to Miri, you told me that the it was the horse. And Miri says, no, that was no, a lie I, you told yourself. Mm-hmm. And I like to. She says, uh, she says, I because Daenerys even says, I just figured you were talking about the horse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, but this is the this whole conversation is really just nobody told you. Yep. Any of the you know, this is all she I told you what I could do. Um, you chose to believe that I was doing all this, you know, out of the goodness of my heart. Oh, I love the thing when Daenerys is like, But I saved you. And she was like, From what though? Mm-hmm. How'd you save me? And uh it's all the stuff you and I talked about, like that she just never really thought about. Mm-hmm. Um, she was she's like, like uh, you... "I'd already been raped by four guys, right? Right? You just came and, and stopped the fifth one, mm-hmm. and they they burned my town, they burned my temple, they killed, you know, my. Well, she has a story about baker. one little boy, oh. yeah, her baker, and then the, the a kid that she had just saved his life a couple months ago, and mm-hmm. then they just rolled into town and killed him." Mm-hmm. And uh, then, then uh, when they're talking about the spell and and what is going on with Cal Drogo, and she is like, you asked for a life. You didn't ask for, like, what type of life. <laughs> true, true. Need to get specific, <sighs> bitch. Yeah, it's like she's a fucking fae or something. Yeah, a little bit. Ugh. Yeah. And there's the other girl that Danny saved. Who just the, like gets like gang raped and then her throat cut? Yeah, I- I- Irio or something. Irio, I don't oh, Rhea, I think something like uh, that. And they f- they found out that um, soon as uh, she because once once 
Daenerys got sick and Khal Drogo has been in this, this state that he's in. Right. There was like some uh, back and forth amongst the men folk mm-hmm. trying to decide who was going to be the next cow. And there was, uh, you know, people broke off and followed different ones. And one of the first things they did was take her. Yeah. Because, you know, Daenerys had intervened. And the minute they had a chance, that one of the like top of their list of priorities of things to do. You know, was yeah. to go back and get this girl who um, you basically denied him. Mm-hmm. Which, Jesus Christ, y'all. Yep. Yeah, this really bummed me out. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a really, like, is it that serious? Like, you can't be told no. You can't be stopped. Like, it's... Yeah. You're so petty. <laughs> you know? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Wow. But, yeah, so Daenerys is like, all right, bet. <laughs> I'm going to go get these motherfuckers. <laughs> and everybody is like, you have, like, 30 people. What do you mean? And she's like, you know, she says... Her, I said what I said. Like, she really did. <laughs> you know, it's like one of the first times she does that whole thing where she announces herself with all the, like, the names and shit. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and she swears that uh, those men are going to die screaming. So let me just go on the record. You heard it here first. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she has to go see Cal Drogo. And this shit is just like, oh, you don't want to see any of this. He's in a bad, bad way. He just sits. He's blind now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he only eats if you put food in his mouth. He only drinks if you pour water on his mouth. Uh, he'll get up and follow you if you lead him somewhere. But he's just... I don't even know what this is. It's its not quite a vegetative state because he's like able to eat and drink and walk around. Mm-hmm. But it's... I don't know what this is, but it's not good. Yeah. And she tries to... Take him out into the night and love him back to life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, basically, yeah, yeah. She, you know, cleans him off and takes him out, and she can't really, you know, fuck him because she just had that kid. But you know, she has other other ways, and she is trying to. I don't know. It's like a ritual. A little bit, you know, yeah. She's she's, she's tr- trying to she's trying to get him hard, and there's just no response from his body. Mm-hmm. And it's like she had to try that and see if that made no difference before she would really accept that there was like no hope, yeah, for trying to yeah. bring him back at all. Yep. And it, uh, she realizes, like you said, this is it, and she, uh, it ends with her uh, going back into her tent to get a cushion. Mm-hmm. And she kneels down, kisses him, and then presses the cushion across his face. Now, but, um, uh, let me ask you, if you had to kill your husband... How would I make it look like an accident? No, we don't even care oh, about no. that. We're the Khaleesi. <laughs> and he's pretty much already dead. Do you use a cushion? If he is practically immobile... Mm-hmm. And he won't be thrashing around in a way that would hurt himself mm-hmm. or me. I mean, I guess it depends on what my other options are. Her situation pillow seems like the the easiest way to go for both her and him. I just feel like you don't even need that. You just put your hand over his mouth and nose. He's not fighting you off. Yeah. It's just maybe to keep her from having I a think- look at his face. I was about to say, I don't want to see the face. So yeah. I'm gonna put a. I'm gonna use a pillow. I don't want to look into those eyes while I'm doing that. You know. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, that's how the chapter ends: is with her smothering Drogo to death. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, what does she have done to uh, Mary Maz? 
Um, I don't remember. Let me go back and I see. Should, I shouldn't have closed the um, book. The stallion who mounts the world will burn no cities now. His calisar shall trample no nations. I like that because she's like, well, that was my child. And she's like, mm, yeah, future mass fucking murderer mm-hmm. and rapist. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm fine right. with it. Um, tell me what you saved. Your life? Miriam Azdur laughed cruelly. Look to your call and see what life is worth when all the rest is gone. Danny called mm. out for the men of her cause and bid them take Miriam as door and bind her hands and her hand and foot. But the Meiji smiled at her as they carried her off as if they shared a secret. Oh, that's it. Just that they carried her off. A word and Danny could have her head off. Yet then what would she have? A head? If life was worthless, what was death? Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, we don't know yet. Maybe it comes up later. Yeah. I can't remember from the show. I feel like I feel like they definitely, she ends up dying. Like, she does not just walk away from this, but I can't remember the particulars. Okay. Um, so, is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap this one up? Um, mm, no. I feel like people are going to want us to go through her dream a little bit more. Um, because, like... The the stuff that Martin puts in dreams often is, like, vaguely prophetic. But it's never really prophetic in the way that, like, it tells you plot things. It's more often prophetic in the way that, like, looking back, you'll realize, oh, that's what he meant. So it doesn't wind up being, like, super... For me, anyway, it doesn't wind up being super rewarding to, like, parse the dreams and stuff the way that some people mm-hmm. like to do. Um, but I, I will just do some basics. So Viserys is yelling at her and his face is like melting. Um, the red door was so far ahead of her and she could feel the icy breath behind sweeping up on her. If it caught her, she would die a death that was more than a death howling forever alone in the darkness. She began to run. What do you think of that? That feels like the others to me. Um... Honestly, nothing. I nothing. <laughs> All right, noted. Um, let's see. She could feel the heat inside her. Drogo's copper skin, her own silver gold hair, violet eyes shaped like diamonds. He sounds fine. And he smiled for her and began to lift his hands. But when he opened his mouth, fire poured out. She saw his heart burning through his chest, and in an instant, he was gone, turned to ash. She wept for her mm. child. Then ghosts like kings, silver hair of gold, platinum and white, blah, blah, blah. Uh, A great knife ripped down her back. She felt her skin tear open and the door loomed before her. The stone was gone as she flew across the Dothraki Sea, high and higher. She could smell home. She could see it just beyond that door, green fields and great stone houses. She threw open the door and saw her brother Rhaegar mounted on a stallion as black as his armor. Hmm. The last dragon, Sir Jor's whis- voice whispered faintly. The last, the last. Danny lifted his polished black visor. The face within was her own. Hmm. So well, that, feels- that sounds pretty. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that seems like it. It's pretty... Self-explanatory. We know where that's going. With her flying, her being the last dragon. It's funny because there's a line about uh, it earlier in her dream. Uh, Sir Jorah says that Rhaegar was the last dragon. Right. And then later on in the dream, she has this moment with Jorah again. And then she sees her brother, but this time it's her. Mm-hmm. Um, I imagine if you are reading this book for the first time, then yeah, when you get to the end of the books, this awe is like, oh, my God, that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. But I think because there are going to be some things that just simply won't really work for me as a reader. Right. You know, mm-hmm. because because I've seen the show. Yep. So, like, the prophetic dreams are probably not going to land that well mm-hmm. or mean, like, quite as much to me because as I'm reading them – they'll feel self-explanatory. Like, right. why am I paying attention to this? Mm-hmm. I, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt the first time, to be honest. Like, I wasn't 
super into it anyway, like trying to read into the, the clues and stuff. But I would participate in message boards and, and things. And I just was sort of like, once I began to realize in retrospect what certain things were, like you said, it's so, it's so, it winds up being so sort of unimportant, that particular bit that it was just, it just feels like an Easter egg in a TV show where it's mm. just like, oh, we just want to let you know we remember this from the book. So I'm just going to say, just real quick, that this thing is in the background, you know, like <laughs> right, Falcon yeah, and Winter yeah. Soldier shit. <laughs> um, and so that's how it felt to me where it's like, I just don't, there are people who've read these books many times and they still enjoy going over some of that stuff. And they think that things mean more than I think they actually mean. And that yeah. might be really where the like discrepancy comes in is that I don't think Martin's doing what they think he's doing. So I just take things differently because to me, I'm mm -hmm. like, mm, I think that's just that's a pretty literal translation of a few like visual puns, actually, and not meant to be a perfect like a prophecy. But right, right. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so we've got two more episodes left next week. Chapter 69. Nice. And chapter 70. And. What do you what <laughs> what do you think is coming? Did you already look ahead at whose chapters they are? I did not. Okay. Who do you think we're getting? Um probably uh a Catlin. Okay. And uh I think we have to get another Daenerys. Next because, week. Because you know the whole thing? Oh, you mean just next week? Yeah, just I'm next sorry. week. Uh, probably Catelyn then. Okay. I mean, I guess it could be Arya. I think it's going to be Catelyn. And? Who's the second one? And then one? the last one is uh, Daenerys, right? Because we still okay, got to so have the big Okay, so we've got Catelyn and moment. Daenerys for 69 and 70, you think? Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Um, And let's see. Oh. What? What? No, I just remember Tyrion, but I feel like uh, <laughs> maybe it'll be Tyrion. I didn't expect this to be such an intense question. Well, because I was trying to think like who who we haven't seen, and I'm also racking my brain trying to remember how the season ends, and oh, you know, okay. kind of cheating. Yeah. I'm gonna stick with I, I'm gonna stick with Catelyn because I said her first. You so. are fucking kind of cheating. I am a little bit. I it's it. HBO's HBO spoiler edition, bitch. Don't you listen to the true, intro? True, 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 true. <laughs> Caught out. <laughs> what were these? Sixty-seven and sixty-eight. Yes, ma'am. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I want to say hi to new patrons. Uh, this week we have Christian Burke, Rebecca Robbins, Molly M, who is my accountant. What's up, Molly? <laughs> Mo and Michael Berry. So welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for all becoming patrons. I hope that you are enjoying the extra content. There is a lot of extra content for patrons. There's lots of content weekly, but there's also a lot of back catalog content. So mm -hmm. uh, if you're somebody who likes to binge, there's many patrons only shows that you can find on the website. Um and otherwise, just a reminder to people who are interested in the Spoil Me episodes, which are me solo uh, on commission, I am still covering Fleabag, finishing up, uh, or I finished season one, just starting season two. Broadchurch, I'm in the middle of season two. I don't think people have decided to commission season three of Broadchurch. Did you watch the third season, Rashawn? I did not. Okay. Did you watch the second one? I did. Okay. That's how it sounds like it's going when people talk about it. A lot of people watch the second one and they sort of just never got around to the yeah. third one. So I'm assuming it sort of peters out. Um, and I'm also covering What We Do in the Shadows, which... Uh, oh, I heard that's great. I've never watched it. It's really funny. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's For me, it's less like laugh out loud funny usually. It's very clever, but there are some serious laugh out loud moments and... Um, it's just one of those things they, they will try and take a movie and make a TV show, you know, out of it, that whole, the premise, but mm -hmm. that really was a movie that ha was, there was so much to be done that turning it into television, it feels really natural and it works super well. 
And uh, the other one that I'm covering that I've been really enjoying is Sex Education, Netflix series. Um, if you guys haven't watched that, I definitely recommend it. It is. Uh, it can be a little heavy here and there. Last episode was kind of a bummer. But it's very well written and really funny and honestly, actually pretty informative also, <laughs> like considering. Um, so I just like to mention because, you know, <clears throat> Spoil Me is the kind of thing that I sort of like figured everybody who was involved with Spoil Me would only be listening because they commissioned it or they are involved in the commissioning of it. But I'm actually having a lot of people who do listen to the Spoil Me episode. I just figure if it's me alone, it's not a that good a listen because it's just uh-huh. one person. And like, how good can that be? <laughs> uh, um, but also some people are just so into a particular property that they'll take any, like, any sort of coverage of it that they can get. Right. So there's also that aspect of it. Um, and lastly, one of my favorite and more ridiculous things that has been commissioned, One Piece, which, uh, Rashawn, I really want you to watch One Piece. <laughs> I have no idea how you're going to react to it. I think you will find it pretty baffling. But I really want to... Like, I want to feel you with me when I'm watching it because it, it is so, it's, I regret, like, somebody asked if I would make it a full on unspoiled show because I quit Doctor Who and, you know, to do that, to take its place. I don't want to do any transitions from Spoil Me into a regular show, but mm-hmm. I do understand that people feel like this is something that you need to share with a person because it is, it's sort of like if you saw something really weird on the highway and there was nobody there to tell, like to look at and be like, did you just see that? And you couldn't get your phone out in time. And afterwards you're trying to convey to somebody the fucking insanity that you just saw on the side of the road and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. It's like you telling them your dream last night, you know, (laughs) that's how one piece is. It's just so fucking weird and it's so aware of itself being weird and it just leans into it even more and I admire <laughs> it. Uh, anyway, so that's another thing I'm covering. I just wanted to... Uh, I have to look that up. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's an anime animated it. series. Uh, it's oh. on Netflix. It's been on for like 20 years. Longest running ever. And uh, everybody recommends to watch it with the you know, original Japanese and subtitles which I have done. I don't know about the other version of it really and how that holds up, but that has not been recommended. But yeah, just if you're, if you're looking to just, you know, get really stoned and just be like, what? (laughs) That is the show to do it with. Just some afternoon that you need to while away in a sort of pleasant confusion. (laughs) I feel like that's the one. I feel like I spend most of my life like that. So (laughs) (laughs) just, Why not? So, uh, okay, guys. Thank you again so much for listening. We love you all. Hope that you've been enjoying our coverage. And we will see you next week with two more chapters. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye, guys. Joffrey. Cersei. Walter Frey. Hold on. Baron Charles. Tywin Lannister. Spoiled Network Podcast. All right, I am recording. Mm-hmm. Ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you just pressed that I, button and hung. I just tried to get myself into the spirit. <laughs> I meant it to be a much more internal hum. You know, just getting my chakras together. <laughs> just... <laughs> You're a little confused, but he in the spirit. <laughs> All right. Ready? Mm-hmm. For real? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you are so unprofessional. <laughs>
I am reacting to the <laughs> environment you have created. <laughs> All of this shit was hum. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. 